Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen I welcome you in this portal hypertension and vascular diseases symposium and uh, uh, Dr Amna already introduced our esteemed chairs Professor Masood Siddiq Professor Hasnan Ali Shah and he has lot of interest in portal hypertension and he has many studies uh, published on this topic Professor Ghassan Nabi Tayyab Professor Farooq Saeed Professor Saleh Channa uh, so So sh should we start? So our first presentation on this topic is vascular targets for the improvement of portal hypertension and I would like to invite Professor Jordi Gracia Sanko from Spain. Um, he has a special interest in liver vascular biology and he's a group leader of uh, research on liver vascular biology. Dear colleagues from the Pakistan Society for the Study of the Liver, I am Jordi Gracia Sancho, Group Leader at the Edibabs Research Institute in Barcelona, Spain and in Selspital Bern in Switzerland. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today and although I would prefer to give this lecture in the beautiful Karachi together with all of you, I'm very grateful to Professor Abbas for the kind invitation to participate in your... These are my disclosures. Today's agenda will be divided in three main topics. First, I will give a, a brief introduction about the portal hypertension pathophysiology and the role of sinusoidal cells, vascular cells, in, in this syndrome. Afterwards, I would move to, to the, uh, the role of the intrahepatic vascular resistance in portal hypertension. And finally, to discuss some vascular therapeutics to promote the improvement in portal hypertension. So, as you will very well know, Clin uh, portal hypertension is a clinical syndrome very frequent in patients with advanced chronic liver disease and is characterized by a pathological increase in the portal pressure gradient or HBPG above its normal value which is around 5 millimeters of mercury. There are many clinical consequences of portal hypertension including the bleeding from gastroesophageal varices, the development of ascites and hepatorenal syndrome, gastropathy, hepatopulmonary syndrome, or hepatic encephalopathy. To understand the, the pathophysiology of portal hypertension, we have to look at the global picture of this disease, of this syndrome, which starts from an elevation in the hepatic vascular resistance, which is the primary factor in the development of portal hypertension, and this further aggravated by a deregulation in vascular cells in the splanchnic territory, which lead to an, in, an increase in portal blood flow, which aggravates and perpetuates portal hypertension syndrome. But if we focus on the intrahepatic mechanisms of portal hypertension, we should first look at the hepatic microcirculatory dysfunction, which is the real underlying mechanism for the elevation in portal pressure. And this dysfunction of liver microcirculation is due to the deregulation of all liver cell types, including the necroapoptosis of hepatocytes, the dysfunction of liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, activation of hepatic stellate cells, and also activation of tougher cells and the recruitment of other hepatic macrophages. So if we have a look, if we have, a, if we take a look at the liver microcirculation, you very well know how peculiar and how distinct it is in comparison to other organs. In the liver, in the liver circulation, we know that we have a dual blood inflow that comes from the portal, uh, uh, portal vein, and the hepatic artery, and this blood drains and diffuses through the parenchyma in the liver microcirculatory system, which is called the liver sinusoid. And the liver sinusoid is composed by three main cell types. We have liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, which are very specific of this uh, vascular bed. They are discontinuous, they present fenestra, and they lack basal membrane, and they play key roles in liver homeostasis, in the control of inflammation, 
in the clearance of toxicants and also regulating vascular tone, as we will see during this lecture. On the other hand, hepatic stellate cells are the pericytes of the, of the liver. They have contractile properties and in a healthy situation, they are a very important storage of vitamin A. Finally, kaffir cells are the resident macrophages of the liver and they play key roles in defense, inflammation and tissue remodeling. But these cell types suffer profound regulations during chronic liver disease. So from a normal function in a healthy liver where liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, kaffir cells, quiescent hepatic stellate cells and hepatocytes, they live in a, in, a, in a healthy and proper condition with proper functions that control the homeostasis of the organ. We know that in response to injury, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells and hepatocytes are the first to respond to this injury, to change their behavior and to affect uh, paracrinally neighboring cells and they change the function and the phenotype and in a situation of chronic liver disease all cell types become dysfunctional and as I said all the cells become pro-inflammatory, pro-constrictory and necroapoptotic, pro-fibrotic, etc. So it's very important to understand how these cells change their phenotype during the progression of liver disease to be able to develop novel therapeutics for the improvement of cirrhosis and for the improvement of portal hypertension. So if we go back to the, to the global picture to understand the intrahepatic mechanisms leading to the elevation in hepatic vascular resistance and in portal pressure, we have two main components that are derived from the dysfunction of these liver cells. We have architectural disturbances, mainly fibrosis, vascular remodeling and the, and the formation of regenerative nodules. And this indeed uh, uh, play a key role in the elevation in the hepatic vascular resistance. But also, and very importantly, there is a, an increment in the hepatic vascular tone by the release of vasoconstrictors, a reduction in vasodilators, and also a sinusoidal hypercontraction in response to these vasoconstrictors that also contribute to the elevation in the, in the vascular resistance. And this is very important because during the last decades, we and others have been studying which are the mediators that play a key role in this elevation in the vascular tone of the cirrhotic liver. And indeed, the, uh, we and others, we have described a, 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 a variety of different mediators that are generated by endothelial cells, also by kaffir cells, and also that come through the systemic circulation that at the end will affect hepatic stellate cells through different uh, uh, cellular receptors leading to a vasoconstriction and an elevation of the resistance. So you can see some, for example, thromboxane, urotensin, leukotrienes, endothelin, and so on. And importantly, the vasodilatory pathways are, are diminished, are reduced in this cirrhotic liver, so we, we have less vasodilatation in the cirrhotic liver vascular bed. Indeed, if we have a look at, the di at this dynamic vascular component of the hepatic vascular resistance, so we know that in a healthy liver, there is a balance between the amount of vasodilators and vasoconstrictors, and also a, a, a very tightly regulated response to these factors. Nevertheless, in chronic liver disease, the situation changes, and we have a, a, an elevation of, of, of the concentration of number of vasoconstrictors in the liver, very little amount of vasodilators, and indeed we have lower response to vasodilators and hyper response to vasoconstrictors. So all together contributing to this increment in the hepatic vascular resistance and in portal pressure. So if we want to promote an improvement, a regression in portal hypertension, we, we must think on the vascular pathways that, are, that play a role in, in this elevation in portal pressure and in the resistance. So we can have a look, for example, to the main vasodilatory pathway within the, the cirrhotic liver, which is the nitric oxide pathway. Nitric oxide is generated by ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Uh, we generate this nitric oxide, which has vasodilatory properties um, through the activation of the soluble guanylate cyclase. This leads to the formation of cyclic GMP, which will lead to vasodilation in the hepatic stellate cell. And therefore, 
we can uh, develop therapies to improve this molecular pathway. Also, we can think on, on targets, on, on, on uh, pharmacological therapies to diminish, to inhibit vasoconstrictory pathways, including urotensin, endothelin, eicosanoids, or angiotensin. And indeed, in the last decade, you can see here a, a, a summary of the amount of different therapies that have been tested at the bench side, so in, in, in translational models, but also in bold, you can see how some of them have been also tested in inpatients. So you can see how for, to target and to improve the vasodilatory pathway mediated by nitric oxide, we have FXR agonists, statins, different ENOS, ENOS cofactors and coactivators, nitric oxide donors, activators of, of the guanylate cyclase, and also inhibitors of the phosphodiesterase. So all these have been tested, and also inhibitors, you can see a variety of inhibitors of the vasoconstrictory pathway, including endothelin antagonist, ecosanoid inhibitors, or modulators of the renin angiotensin system. One of these that uh, one of these therapeutic targets that may have an impact in the clinical setting are statins. Indeed, statins have been tested in different clinical uh, prospective trials, acute statin, one month statin and two year statin, and also different retrospective statins have shown uh, or have suggested beneficial effects of statins in portal hypertension and in the development of chronic liver disease and cancer. Indeed, our team was the first to, to demonstrate the beneficial effects of statins improving portal hypertension. In 2004, we demonstrated how acute administration of statin was able to reduce the postprandial increase in HBPG in patients with chronic liver disease. And this was validated in, in, a, in a randomized controlled trial where patients receive one month treatment with placebo or statin, as you can see. And in those patients receiving statins, they exhibit a, a significant reduction in HBPG in comparison to those receiving placebo. And more recently, we also published a two-year uh, randomized controlled trial where uh, patients that uh, came into the hospital due to a decompensation, in, in particular due to bleeding, uh, they received during two years simvastatin or placebo. And you can see how a patient receiving this uh, vasoprotective compound, in, indeed simvastatin, the, pro the predicted probability of death was lower, so they, they exhibit an improved survival in comparison to those patients uh, receiving placebo. And how statins improve the phenotype and the, and the and portal hypertension in patients with chronic liver disease? So now we know, and thanks to the, the work that we have been developing during the last years, that statins, which as you know are inhibitors of the intracellular uh, synthesis of cholesterol, but in addition to this in inhibition, they also inhibit different small GTPases, and in, co in, in, co in concrete, we know that they inhibit RAG1 and ROA, and this leads to an improvement in different molecular pathways downstream of these two small GTPases that at the end leads to an improvement in, in uh, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, which become vasodilatory, anti-inflammatory, antithrombotic, and antioxidant, and also statins improve the the phenotype of hepatic stellate cells, which become vasodilatory, antifibrogenic, and antiproliferative. Also, we can think on promoting an improvement in portal hypertension, targeting the, the main mediators of the pathophysiology, which, is, which are apoptosis, inflammation, oxidative stress, which ultimately lead to fibrosis. And indeed, in the last decades, we have been working on different, molec on different molecules, different therapeutic uh, strategies to improve portal hypertension, including antioxidants, anti-apoptotic drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs, microbiota modulators, anti-diabetics, and also different strategies improving or, or, or aimed at improving uh, the regeneration of the liver. And today I, I, I want to, to, to share with you some recent data that we obtained using a, a PIPAR agonist, which is called anifibrano. So lanifibranor is a pan piper agonist that leads to the, uh, the uh, activity, expression and activity of pipars, which are a nuclear receptors transcription factors. 
And uh, these pan piper agonists in preclinical models of chronic liver disease, we have demonstrated, and this has been just recently published, how two weeks uh, administration of lanifibranor leads to a significant decrease in portal pressure in animals with cirrhosis. And this is accompanied by a significant reduction in fibrosis, as you can see here, in animals receiving lanifibranor in comparison to vehicle-treated animals. And obviously, in this manuscript, we have described all the molecular or, or, or the majority of molecular pathways that are affected by lanifibranor in, in liver sinusoidal endothelial cells and also in hepatic stellate cells, so you can, you can read it. It's open access, so you can have a look. And interestingly, this is a preclinical uh, study that indeed uh, can be uh, or, or has been uh, partially validated in a, in a randomized controlled trial that has been also uh, very recently described or, or in, in, the, in the American meeting uh, one month ago, where patients with NASH that receive 24 weeks lanifibranor at two different, um, two different dosing and were compared with a placebo group, you can see how these patients receiving lanifibranor exhibit an improvement in NASH, even resolution of NASH. And also, and we can see here in the preclinical model, uh, patients receiving the high dose of lanifibranor also exhibit a regression in, in fibrosis. So indeed suggesting that lanifibranor could be a novel therapeutic target and a novel therapeutic agent to promote fibrosis regression and also improvement in portal hypertension. So uh, how lanifibranor works? So we believe that lanifibranor, because affects different PIPARs, it's able to improve LSEC, it's able to improve the hepatocyte uh, phenotype, also the recruitment of different macrophages, and also to improve the phenotype of hepatic stellate cells, all together leading to an improvement in portal hypertension. So, to finalize, I would like to wrap up saying that the progression of liver disease is very important to think that the, the development of microvascular dysfunction and also the development of fibrosis leads to an, an increase in hepatic vascular resistance, which ultimately leads to portal hypertension. To understand the pathophysiology of portal hypertension, we should look and we should pay attention on these uh, cellular mechanisms that lead to the elevation in the hepatic vascular resistance. And as I, uh, as I explained, different therapeutic targets have uh, results that are very promising and may have an impact in the clinical um, treatment of patients with chronic liver disease and portal hypertension. I would like to finalize. Thank, thank you to all my team in Barcelona and also in, in, in Bern, collaborators worldwide and the, uh, the funding agencies. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and I would be happy to take any question. Thank you, Professor Jordi Garcia for such a nice presentation on new agents for the uh, reducing portal hypertension. So do we have any questions, Rimsha? So we take questions in the last of the session. So our next presentation is on post-bleeding and peri-procedure anticoagulation in cirrhosis, when to start and when to stop. And I would like to invite Professor Altaf Alam, uh, the renowned gastroenterologist and hepatologist of Pakistan. <laughs> It is indeed a matter of great honor for me to be invited here to talk on this invited lecture at the 14th annual meeting of Pakistan Society of Study of Liver Diseases. And I'm thankful to the organizers, particularly Professor Zaham Abbas and Dr. Amna Suman to have provided me this opportunity. The topic of the talk allocated to me is post-bleeding and peri-procedural anticoagulation in cirrhosis. When to start? and when to stop. I'm Dr. Altaf Alam, ex-professor and head department of gastroenterology and hepatology at Sheikh Zayed Hospital Lahore in Pakistan, currently working as a consultant hepatologist at Evercare Hospital Lahore. I have no disclosures to make, and I bring greetings from my hometown Lahore to all those who are attending this meeting all over the world. This is what I'm going to talk about after a brief introduction, I'll 
briefly highlight some laboratory tests of coagulation and their reliability in cirrhosis, anticoagulant safety and reversal in cirrhosis. And through three cases, I'm going to discuss practical management of anticoagulation in cirrhosis. So just to reiterate some, so just to reiterate some, some facts about coagulation in cirrhosis, this condition is characterized by impaired synthesis of all clotting factors except factor eight and von Willebrand factor. This defect has historically been documented, been documented through the prolongation of PT and APTT. Platelet counts are low in cirrhosis due to portal hypertension. Conventional hemostasis tests correlate poorly with GI bleeding, bleeding after liver biopsy, and bleeding in major liver surgery. So in short, platelet count, PT, and APTT alone are inadequate to reflect the coagulation balance as it occurs in vivo, especially in cirrhosis. This is just to highlight the normal and the rebalanced, as we call it, hemostatic system in normal liver and in cirrhosis. As you can see in normal liver, both pro and anti-hemostatic factors have a very stable balance. Whereas in cirrhotic liver, although the hemostatic mechanism is rebalanced, but this is rather on a slippery slope and can swing in one direction or the other, leading to either bleeding or thrombosis. This is just to highlight the normal coagulation ca cascade and the site of action of various anticoagulants. As you can see, heparin and one of the DOACs, dabigatran, acts directly on thrombin. Whereas warfarin works through vitamin K dependent coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So this is the normal mechanism of action of warfarin, heparin, and dabigatran. Whereas rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban act as direct anti 10A inhibitors. So this is briefly the normal extrinsic and intrinsic pathway and the site of action of various anticoagulants. Cirrhosis is a unique situation where despite this rebalanced hemostatic mechanism, there is tendency to thrombosis as well as bleeding. If a cirrhotic patient is hospitalized, he is more likely to get thrombosis than general population because of reduced anticoagulant, reduced ADMTS13 activity, whereas von Willebrand factor, factor eight, and procoagulant vesicles are increased. This favors thrombosis. Whereas a cirrhotic patient can bleed as well. Although traditionally, we were taught that this is due to coagulopathy. This is not true. Although there is tendency to bleed in cirrhosis due to reduced procoagulant factors, reduced platelet number, reduced platelet function, whereas fibrinolysis and red cell mass is decreased. So there is a tendency, but cirrhotic patients hardly ever bleed because of coagulopathy. The cause of bleeding in cirrhosis is portal hypertension, endothelial dysfunction, bacterial infections, and renal failure. And now we know that these are much more important than coagulopathies. So therapeutic interventions should be targeting these ab abnormalities to prevent bleeding in cirrhosis rather than treating coagulopathy. Plasma coagulation is not abnormal in cirrhosis when assessed with global tests reflecting the function of both pro and anticoagulants. And this challenges the myth that the usefulness of traditional coagulation tests in assessing hemorrhagic tests in 
risk in cirrhosis and the use of procoagulant agent or plasma to correct coagulopathy. So there is certainly need for a test that under in vitro conditions may mix more closely what is happening in vivo. And fortunately, today in 2020, we have thromboelastogram tag or rotatory thromboelastometry or ROTAM. These are certainly not ideal, but the best you can get today. Just to highlight, what do the tag shows in terms of um, coagulation cascade through R time, K time, maximum amplitude, alpha angle, clot lysis at 30 minutes, percentage clot lysis at 30 minutes, you can have a very good idea of what is happening in the coagulation and how can we correct that by giving various agents that are available in our armamentarium. This also gives the normal values for various uh, parameters that I have mentioned, and it also highlights how to correct these. I'm not going to go into the detail. This is certainly not a hematology lecture, but it is just important for you to know that there are tests available, and they have been used for a long time in the trauma uh, setting, in the operation theater, cardiothoracic surgeries, and now particularly in liver surgeries and liver transplant surgery. What about anticoagulant safety in patients with chronic liver disease? Well, heparin, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and warfarin are indicated by FDA for use in all classes of cirrhosis, A, B, and C. But the problem here is that titrating warfarin to therapeutic INR in child class C may be rather difficult. So there are practical problems. Whereas DOAX or NOAX, whatever you call them, have their limitations for use in cirrhosis. They are all okay in child class A, but generally they are to be used with caution in child class B, and certainly none of them is safe to be used in child class C. So this is just the background of anticoagulants in cirrhosis. It is also important to know metabolism and elimination of anticoagulants through either hepatic or renal route. And as you can see, this, apart from dabigatran, all the anticoagulants, warfarin, revoraxaban, edoxaban, and apexaban are excreted mainly through the liver, whereas dabigatran has a major excretion pathway through the kidneys. This just highlights if there is an indication for anticoagulation in cirrhotic patient after safety assessment through lab test and clinical examination, go for endoscopy and treat varices based on various guidelines, be it easel or apostle or ASLD guidelines. And you can uh, then be ready to anticoagulate uh, your patients for, as mentioned here in child class A, all DOAX and warfarin, child class B, DOAX with caution and warfarin, in child class C, no DOAX, anticoagulants are generally not indicated, but this is not true, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. What do I do? In child class A, I use low molecular weight heparin followed by warfarin, uh, DOAX in grade two to four portal vein thrombosis. I'm just going to highlight what I mean by the grading of portal vein thrombosis. Whereas in grade one portal vein thrombosis, I just observe and follow up. In child class B and C, I tend to err in favor of low molecular weight heparin only. Whereas in only a few patients who have a reliable follow-up uh, tendency, I start them on warfarin. Of course, in transplant candidates, this is of great importance. Uh, and we continue to treatment till transplant. In non-liver transplant candidates, with, child, with grade two to four portal vein thrombosis, I 
as mentioned, again, rely mainly on enoxaparin, whereas in rare patients who show a tendency to reliable follow-up, I put them on warfarin, whereas grade one, I observe and follow up. This is just to tell you what is the grading of uh, portal vein thrombosis. Grade one is partial portal vein thrombosis. Grade two is almost complete or complete portal vein thrombosis may be extending up to, uh, just uh, extending to the superior mesenteric uh, vein. Grade three is complete thrombosis of portal vein and proximal superior mesenteric vein, whereas distal superior mesenteric vein is open. Grade four is complete thrombosis of portal vein, superior mesenteric vein, and maybe involving the splenic vein as well. So this is just to tell you, as I mentioned, how to treat, how to classify portal vein thrombosis. I'm just going to highlight a few case summaries. Case number one, 60 year old man with cirrhosis admitted to the hospital with suspected SBP. His BMI is 35, he's severely deconditioned and largely bed bound. His admission tests show platelets of 65,000 and INR of 1.6. The questions are, can diagnostic acetic tab be done safely? Should he be placed on a VTE or venous thromboembolic prophylaxis on admission? In terms of the question, can diagnostic acetic tab be done safely? The answer is yes. All the guidelines recommend that thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy is not a contraindication for diagnostic acetic tab. In response to the question, should he be placed on VTE prophylaxis on admission, I mentioned uh, Padua's prediction score for venous thromboembolism, and my patient is bedridden, so a score of three, obese, obese score of one, and any patient with equal to or more than four score should be anticoagulant. So what I did, here, low molecular weight heparin, 40 milligram per day, stopped after 10 days at the time of discharge. Let's go to case summary two, 60 year old male patient with HCV related cirrhosis who achieved SVR on DAs three years ago. Ultrasound abdomen six weeks ago showed a grade three portal vein thrombosis confirmed by cross-sectional imaging with no evidence of HCC. He was started on warfarin and stabilized on five milligram per day after excluding esophageal varices and other lab tests. Seen four weeks ago with INR 2.6. Missed last clinic appointment two weeks ago. Seen in AE with hematemesis and melena. History of fall four weeks ago with backache and self-medication with ibuprofen for four weeks. Hemodynamically unstable. Hemoglobin 6.9, platelets 90, and INR 6.5. After immediate resuscitation and reversal of anticoagulation, an upper GI endoscopy showed a posterior wall duodenal ulcer with a visible vessel which was treated endoscopically with adrenaline injection and application of two clips and admitted in ICU. Supportive treatment and PPI infusion was continued. Warfarin was not restarted yet. The question arises, why to anticoagulate a cirrhotic patient with portal vein thrombosis? Well, the data is very clear here that patients in cirrhosis with portal vein thrombosis if anticoagulated, there is high chance of portal vein recanalization and through reduced bacterial type translocation, they have improved survival. And there is even data emerging that in cirrhotic patients, particularly child class B and C, who do not have portal vein thrombosis, prophylactic anticoagulation can improve survival, particularly with low molecular weight heparin. So there is no question that the decision was right in anticoagulating this patient. How did we reverse his anticoagulant effect of warfarin? Stopped warfarin, given injection vitamin K. There is debate whether you should use FFP or prothrombase complex concentrate, and the consensus is very clear. Prothrombin complex concentrate is better than FFP. But we don't have it in Pakistan. The cost is great. The problem with FFP is its cost, uh, is its volume. You need to give at least 10 to 20 cc per kilogram body weight, which would be 800 to 1500 cc 
uh, of FFP to achieve any results. Whereas prothrombin complex concentrate with the name of Beriplex or K Centra is very small volume and very, very effective. And it corrects coagulation factors very quickly. But the cost is great, costing something like four to 5,000 US dollars. When to restart warfarin in this patient? Well, it generally depends on underlying risk from thrombosis versus re-bleeding. And we did not start this patient on uh, anticoagulants for two weeks. But in general, it can be restarted two to five days later, or bridging with low molecular heparin may be needed in select cases with high risk of thrombosis. What would I have done if my patient was on DOAX? Of course, stop DOAC. DOAC plasma level and NT10 activity is not available in Pakistan. Specific antidote, Idarasuzumab for dabigatran and endexanet alpha for rivaroxaban, apexaban, and endoxaban is not available in Pakistan and very, very costly, costing something like with a price of starting from 25,000 US dollars. Tranexamic acid, FFP, and prothrombase complex concentrate are not evidence-based, but helpful. Maybe restarted two to five days after a procedure or control of bleeding, weighing the risk of thrombosis versus bleeding, oblique, re-bleeding. Coming to case number three, I have a relatively young patient with suspected autoimmune hepatitis who has underlying ITP and a platelet count of 30,000. A call was sent to IR for liver biopsy, but he refused to do liver biopsy and advised to increase the platelet count to above 60,000. How can we do that? Just five days therapy with EVA thrombobag is sufficient. Based on the number of platelets, it can be either 40 or 60 milligram only for five days. And the procedure can be performed anytime between 10 to 14 days. And thrombobac is not recommended because of its hepatotoxic and thrombotic tendency. But in Pakistan, where ever thrombobac is and lusotrombobac is not available, it may be used with caution. So take home points. Cirrhosis represents a rebalanced hemostatic state. Usual tests of coagulation do not reflect the true hemostatic balance in vivo in cirrhosis. Bleeding in cirrhosis is rarely seen due to coagulopathy, and these patients are at an increased risk of thromboembolism as well. Knowledge of pharmacokinetics, mechanism of action, and reversing effects of anticoagulants is crucial in the management of cirrhotic patients requiring these drugs. Thank you, and I thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Altaf Alam, for such an enlightening talk. As we all know that it's very difficult to treat cirrhosis with uh, coagulation disorders. It's just like a double-edged sword. So our next uh, presentation <coughs> is on non-cirrhotic portal hypertension, controversies in the diagnosis and management. And I would like to invite our esteemed inst uh, professor from India, Professor Anil Arora. Professor Anil Arora is Chairman Institute of Liver, Gastroenterology, and Pancreatobiliary Sciences, uh, Ganga Ram Institute uh, of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, uh, New Delhi. I welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Are my slides visible? Yes. Okay. First of all, I am extremely thankful to the 14th organizing committee of the 14th PSSLD meeting, especially Dr. Zagam Abbas and Dr. Amna for having given me this opportunity. In this difficult time, of an obscure, minuscule coronavirus which is causing havoc all over the world. It is so good to see such good quality of academics being presented in PSSLD. It was an honor listening to both the talks which was presented by the previous speakers. The topic which has been allotted to me is non serotic portal fibrosis, controversies in diagnosis and management. Greetings from Sir Gangaram Hospital. We also have a branch of this prior to the partition in Lahore, which is actively functioning. Portal hypertension by default is characterized by increase in the portal pressure to more than 10 millimeter. 
it can occur because of the problems within the liver called cirrhosis as a cause of the portal hypertension or you can have absence of cirrhosis called non cirrhosis as a cause of portal hypertension in patient with non cirrhotic portal fibrosis the problem may lie prior to entry of the portal vein into the liver called prehepatic causes which are characterized as extra hepatic portal vein obstruction in which you can have splenic vein thrombosis which may even extend onto the meso superior mesenteric vein and occasionally you can have an ab fistula within the liver you can have pre sinusoidal and post sinusoidal portal hypertension even without causing cirrhosis and these are called hepatic causes of non cirrhotic portal fibrosis and prior to the formation of the major hepatic veins and entry of the hepatic veins out into the inferior vena cava you can have post hepatic causes which include primarily those related to the heart as the inferior inferior vena cava just above the liver is of very short length and any cause in the region of the right heart like constrictive pericarditis severe tricuspid regurgitation or extensive and major right sided heart failure can present as non cirrhotic portal fibrosis within the liver the major pre sinusoidal causes include non cirrhotic portal fibrosis which i am going to discuss in detail especially in countries like egypt you have this parasitic infection called cystosomiasis within the liver you can have a sinusoidal obstruction even before development of cirrhosis of the liver typically occurring because of the alcoholic hepatitis hypervitaminosis a and there is an entity which can occur since childhood and even at birth called incomplete septal fibrosis which can lead to development of sinusoidal hypertension and classically within the liver there are two disease entities called veno occlusive disease in which there is a deposition of the collagen material in the subendothelial space causing obstruction to the outflow tract of the liver and then you have a classical bud carry syndrome in which there is an extensive thrombosis of the hepatic venous system so my, as my talk was on trying to tell you what are the controversies in management so first of all let me tell you what is known about non cirrhotic portal fibrosis what is clearly known is it is a disease of uncertain etiology it is characterized by extensive periportal fibrosis that means the fibrosis in and around the small and the medium vessels of the portal venous radicals within the hepatic parenchyma typically involves small and the medial branches of the portal vein pathologically characterized by phlebosclerosis and phlebothrombosis resulting into the obstruction to the flow of the pile uh, flow of the portal vein from blood from the portal vein out into the inferior vena cava surprisingly and luckily for us luckily for our patients the liver functions and structure of the liver that tends to be rem, rem, tends to remain normal and that is good for all of us however there are lot of debates regarding the etiopathogenesis of non cirrhotic portal fibrosis we do not know whether an infection which precipitates or is the cause for development of non cirrhotic portal fibrosis is it the exposure to the trace metals and the chemicals which can result in ncpf are there any immunological immunogenetic reasons which can be hypothesized to cause to explain this problem is it a pro thrombotic state in which you will have flebo thrombosis of the small and the medium vessels within the liver or there is a unifying hypothesis which i am going to talk to you now in unifying hypothesis we presume that you need to have a precipitating event be it in the form of an infection trauma or a thrombotic event the in presence of a precipitating event if you have an underlying pre thrombotic or pro thrombotic predisposition which is either genetically present or acquired in life with passage of time there could be two types of injuries within the liver in first injury which occurs early in the childhood which is severe and progressive there is an extensive blockage of the extra hepatic portal venous system this is called ehpvo or extra hepatic portal vein obstruction but if the same injury be it the infection trauma or the prothrombotic state is mild if it is recurring it occurs later in the childhood or early adolescence and typically involves not the extra hepatic portal venous system but the peripheral portal venous radicals within the liver then you have a classical entity called non cirrhotic portal fibrosis 
There is another entity of explanate, explaining the same thing in terms of development of portal hypertension in patient with NCPA. This dual theory presupposes that the primary pathology lies within the smaller and the medium-sized portal venous radicals within the liver. So there is an obliteration characterized by phlebothrombosis and phlebosclerosis of the various type of small and the medium channels within the portal venous radicals of the liver. Or else there is a problem within the spleen which leads to splenic venous inflow, increase in the splenic venous inflow which leads to hyperdynamic circulation which precipitates non-serotic portal fibrosis. So what happens is as the noxious agents or as the infectious agents tend to come into the portal vein that leads to changeover of the endothelial cells to the myo fibroblast-like cells. So there is an extracellular type of collagen deposition in and around the medium and the small vessels of the portal venous radicals leading to obliterative venopathy, which is the classical hallmark of the pathological picture seen in patients with non-serotic fibrosis. So what are these common infectious agents? These could in infections could include bacterial, protozoal, and cystosomiasis infection. There could be drugs and toxins which may be causing the same a problem within the liver, and this could be in the form of arsenic, vinyl chloride, copper sulfate, methotrexate, 6-MP, isothioprine, diadonacine, irradiation, and vitamin A hypertoxicity or over increase in the levels of the vitamin A within the liver. Then you can have an underlying prothrombotic state in the form of JAK2 mutation, MTHFR defi deficiency, and the protein C and protein S deficiency, which lead to developed of the prothrombotic state. All this could be causing deposition of the uh, material within the medium and small venous radicals within the liver causing NCPF. Then you have this theory called infective hypothesis, which typically occurs in areas in and around India, Pakistan, with economic background. This was proposed by Dr. Sareen from India, who said that you have inf abdominal infection at birth or in early childhood, that leads to umbilical sepsis. In fact, if you remember, at least in some of the Indian cities in the olden days, whenever the child was born and the umbilical cord was cut by the dyes which were conducting the deliveries, part of the cow dung used to be applied to that. So that could lead to umbilical sepsis, resulting in spread of the infection from the vitiline duct into the left part of the portal venous radicals, leading to extrahepatic portal vein obstruction. And this repeated portal pyemia and pyeloflobitis will lead to thrombosis, sclerosis, and obstruction of the various channels within the portal venous system causing NCPF. There were also theories which were propounded earlier. Again, this is a major data published again from India that uh, was published from Calcutta by Dr. Goha Majumdar's group that high level of arsenic in the drinking water or other Toxic chemicals in the form of vinyl chloride, monomer, or copper sulfate were also thought to be responsible for uh, development of NCPA. In fact, Dr. Sareen also tried to show that if the mice were fed on arsenic for a prolonged period of time, they, they had 4 to 14 fold increase in the hepatic hydroxyproline and hepatic collagen deposition in the portal venous radicals as compared to the placebo controlled mice. In fact, both from the pediatric studies and adult studies, this is the data primarily from India, it has been shown repeatedly that a significant proportion, both in the pediatric and the adult population, in those with non-serotic portal fibrosis and EHPVO have underlying prothrombotic states, which could be one of the reasons which can be, pre which can be precipitated by the incoming noxious agents like infection, trauma, etc. This is the data published from Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of India, which is one of the super speciality hospitals of gastroenterology in Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow, in which in children, out of the 14 patients, 19 patients with extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, they could find out the prothrombotic state in as many as 14 out of the 19 patients who had this disease. In fact, other studies, again from India as well as from abroad, had clearly shown in both patients with non-serotic portal fibrosis as well as in EHPVO, even in adults, it up to 20 to 30 percent of the patients may have an underlying prothrombotic state. So to sum up NCPF and extrahepatic portal venous obstruction, 
they primarily start either as an infection and inflammation in presence of other diseases. So if in early childhood you have a severe infection that leads to complete blockage of the main portal vein, resulting in not only extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, but also development of portal vein cavernoma, presenting early in the childhood and up to the age of 20 years with first episode of major variceal bleeding. Whereas if you have a chronic infection starting late in the adolescence and early childhood, presenting with mild symptoms, usually related to the chronic antigenemia like infection or, or uh, say microthrombosis because of the underlying thrombotic state, then you have a pre-sinusoidal portal hypertension which primarily involves the small and the medium vessels within the portal venous system, excluding the main portal vein, resulting in something called concerotic thrombosis. Both these conditions tend to produce NCPF. This is the data. In fact, we are proud to announce that, in fact, in, in fact one of the major contributions to science from India has been the uh, recording of NCPF as a major entity, which has been subsequently recognized all over the world. These have been the various studies from India, different parts of India, including Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Hyderabad, and Chandigarh, different cases, their male to female ratio, more common in males, and typically the disease will present by the age of 20 to 30 years as against extrahepatic portal vein obstruction which typically occurs in the first two decades of the life and where this has been the one of the best publications we have had from india as well as from japan which have tried to elucidate the pathophysiology of the ncpf in the world and in which the typically the liver is normal but in 10 to 15 percent of the cases you can have a nodularity of the liver this occurs because of the incomplete septal fibrosis which occurs because of the phlebothrombosis and sclerosis within the portal venous radical. Typically, the portal vein is dilated and on pathology, you can beautifully see the thrombosis in the smaller vessels. So if you look at the hemodynamic in such a situation, in a normal person, hepatic venous pressure, sinusoidal pressure and portal vein pressure will be clearly delineated. If you look at a patient with a pre-sinusoidal portal hypertension, the, hepat the hepatic venous pressure will be normal, sinusoidal pressure will be normal, whereas HPVG will be normal. So if you have a patient with portal hypertension with normal HPVG, that is a classical setting of non-serotic portal fibrosis. Even today, the role of hemodynamics is in patients who have so-called nodular liver on ultrasonography, who have low HPVG, we do a, tend to do a liver biopsy, which clearly shows that the patient do not have cirrhosis, but NCPF as the cause of the liver disease. But with passage of time, we have started realizing that NCPF is entity which is decreasing in incidence and prevalence, possibly because of the improvement in the socioeconomic status in the, in country like ours, that we are seeing less of less and less of it. I like to ask my colleagues in Pakistan as to what is happening to their NCPF. In hemodynamic studies, once you document a raised portal pressure, with the normal HVPG, that is a classical setting of non serotic portal fibrosis. Typically, as I said, it is a disease of the male preponderance. Most of the patient will present either with a lump in the left upper quadrant or a major upper GI bleeding. They will have symptoms and signs of the consequences of hypersplenism. Occasionally, after the bleeding, they tend to develop ascites, whereas the jaundice and encephalopathy are pretty uncommon. So because of the large size of the spleen, because of the hypersplenism and GI bleeding, their presentation mimic that of cirrhosis of the liver. There are some basic differences in between non-serotic portal fibrosis and extrahepatic portal vein obstruction. This is an again publication from uh, uh, India in which typically most of the patient with EHPV will be much younger. They NCPF is more likely to occur in males. Most of the patient with NCPF will present with massive splenomegaly and major GI bleeding. Whereas portal gastropathy and the portal biliopathy is far more common in extrahepatic portal vein obstruction than what we see in patients with NCPF. And the major reason is these patients have a portal vein which is replaced by development of the portal vein cavernoma. This is a bunch of the collateral vessels which tend to compress the portal venous system. And up to 30% of the patient beyond the age of 40 years will tend to develop portal encephalopathy. If you look at the endoscopic finding in these patients, most of these have, will have esophageal and gastric varices. Typically, NCPF patient will have larger varices and will bleed heavily. 
But the reason you suspect the patient to have NCPF and not cirrhosis as the cause of the bleeding is most of these patients do not decompensate, do not develop ascites and pedal edema or encephalopathy after ascites. So young man, repeated bleeding, tolerating it well, no encephalopathy, no ascites is a classical NCPF, which we used to see in the olden days. It is becoming quite infrequent in these days. Anorectal viruses somehow tend to occur far more common in a large, much larger fashion in NCPF than in patients with uh, uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Diagnosis is typically made by routine ultrasonography. Then you do a Doppler study to look for evidence of thrombotic state or evidence of the portal vein thrombosis as has been very well delineated by Professor Altaf Alam. And then you have a classical demonstration of blockage of the portal vein and development of the collateral by the triple phase CT scan or CT or MR angiography, which will give you an answer. Whenever you come across a patient like this, you must rule out child A cirrhosis, especially if the person is elderly and has been taking alcohol or have other etiological features for development of cirrhosis of the liver. And in patients with the, uh, acute or chronic extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, occasionally large collaterals running parallel to portal vein may mimic as the main portal vein and CT angiography can give an answer. The basic difference between three is that EHPV occurs at a younger age, NCPF in the middle age, cirrhosis at a later age. Most of the patients with cirrhosis, by the time they have bleeding, they will have ascites. Encephalopathy and jaundice is a sign of failing liver, which will occur in cirrhosis, not in pre-cirrhotic causes. Typically, liver functions are maintained in patients with non-cirrhotic uh, fibrosis of the liver. And, tip and typically, the liver on ultrasonography will look to be normal. If you do a liver biopsy, this is done primarily to rule out cirrhosis of the liver rather than to diagnose NCPF of the liver. And Doppler ultrasonography is a very good modality to diagnose NCPF. Typically, in patients with the variceal bleeding, the treatment is almost the same as has been mentioned earlier by the different speaker as to how to manage variceal bleeding, except that in patients with extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, TIP is not a feasible uh, option. Because the, because the portal vein has been replaced by a bunch of collaterals. Shunt surgery is indicated in such patients only if the patients have persistent and pain in the splenic region or repeated splenic infarct, if they have intractable bleeding, or if these patients have symptomatic hypersplenism. Hypersplenism, which tends to occur in 40 to 80 percent of the patients, mostly can be managed clinically and uh, conservatively in, pa in patients who have symptomatic hypersplenism or if the patient has significant anemia or repeated infection, this is the time when you need to take up the patient for shunt surgery and a distal splenorenal shunt has, gives you excellent results with almost no incidence of encephalopathy after that. The difference between shunt surgery of cirrhosis and MCPF is that if you do surgery in patients with MCPF, you're able to prevent the recurrence of the hemorrhage. It takes care of the massive enlarging spleen, it tries to correct the abnormalities of the hypersplenism, increases the growth and improves the quality of life. Prognosis overall in patients with non cirrhotic portal fibrosis is much better in than those with the cirrhosis of the liver and they have hardly any mortality if the liver bleeding can be taken care of very well and if the patient who, in fact, our policy in our hospital, if the patient comes to us from a distant area where the facilities for endoscopy are not available, and if patient has more than one episode of massive bleeding requiring blood transfusion, we advise them one time treatment with the linorenal shunt. To uh, conclude, ladies and gentlemen, extrahepatic portal vein obstruction and NCPF are important causes of portal hypertension in India, but their prevalence and incidence is certainly com coming down. Is it because of the changing socioeconomic status or increasing the economy, we do not know. Recurrent pyeloflebitis resulting in obstruction of either the intrahepatic or extrahepatic portal vein system in patients genetically predisposed to these conditions can result in pre sinusoidal portal hypertension, which can present either as EHPVO, which is recurrent variceal bleeding with splenomegaly growth retardation, primarily in the first two decades of the life, or in the later. Uh, uh, in the later adolescence or early childhood, the recurrent variceal bleeding without hepatic decompensation. Diagnosis is typically made with the help of ultrasonography and confirmed by CT angiography. 
Recurrent variceal bleeding is managed as we do in patients with cirrhosis of the liver. Gastric and rectal variceal bleeding is far more common in NCPF than in cirrhosis of the liver. Surgery with for patients with symptomatic hyperspinism, recurrent variceal bleeding and growth retardation is an excellent option in patients with NCPF. Portal biliopathy is a unique finding in patients with extrahepatic portal vein obstruction. And overall, the outcome of these patients in, uh, with portal hypertension with NCPF is much better than if it would occur in patients with cirrhosis or bud carry syndrome. With the, that, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over the proceeding back to the moderators and chairpersons. Thank you, Professor Anil Arora, for such an enlightening presentation on such an important topic. Um, so we have uh, two questions from um, for uh, prof uh, for uh, Professor uh, Alam from Dr. Nadeem Thiami. So question is, in case of portal vein thrombosis with complications on anticoagulants, does cavernous transformation guide your decision to restart anticoagulation? Uh, very good question. Uh, in my book, uh, cavernous transformation means chronic portal vein thrombosis. So you have to look at the indications for, for starting anticoagulation very closely. Remember, the tests of uh, uh, inherited uh, disorders of coagulations, some of them are not reliable, but not all. So if the patient has antiphospholipid or anticardiolipid antibodies positive or thrombin mutation, I would certainly start the patient on anticoagulation, not to help the portal vein thrombosis, but to prevent uh, venous thromboembolism at other sites. So that is what I would do so selective cases of cavernous transformation in portal vein thrombosis are still candidates for anticoagulation if they have genetic uh, problems with the uh, coagulation. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Can I answer that question, sir, also? Yes. Yeah, please, yes. sir. Please. OK. Uh, we have a different policy of managing portal vein thrombosis. It is a very common event in patients with cirrhosis, and it is just a function of the deteriorating liver function. If you look at the prevalence and incidence of portal vein thrombosis, it increases dramatically from child A via child B to child C. In fact, if you look at the data of patients going for liver transplantation, 50% will have cirrhosis with portal vein thrombosis in child C. So our indications for treatment will be, first and foremost, is the patient has to be symptomatic, number one. Patient is destined to go under liver transplantation and or if there is an extension of the thrombosis into the mesenteric system, with impending gangrene. Short of that, if you look at the data of even the bland thrombosis, if you just follow them up without treatment, one third will resolve, one third will stabilize, one third will increase in, uh, in, in its uh, propensity to cause more problem. That is because, as you very rightly said, there is a very precarious balance. And you're always worried about trying to give anticoagulation, anticoagulation to a patient who already has an INR of, say, 2.5 or 3. So this is the major issues. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Another question from Dr. Nadeem Thiami for Professor Alam. Uh, if TEGLY30 is prolonged in bleeding liver patient, then would you advocate tranexamic acid with, when halted concluded otherwise? OK, uh, another very good question. Uh, halted was not relying on a tag. So if your tag in, in theater, in a liver transplant surgery, is telling you that uh, LY30 is more than 3%, then I would certainly give tranexamic acid. Thank you. What's your comments, uh, Professor Anil, on this question? Yeah, you see, uh, if you look at the components of the tech, which we, we, we always talk it in terms of, you know, whenever we have webinars, but if you look at the practical implication, not and, and not units other than those who are doing liver transplantation or doing it in routine practice. I don't know how many of hepatology centers in the absence of transplantation are using it in day-to-day -day practice. I'll agree with the professor Altaf Alam, uh, rather than 
blindly you know our icu people still do not listen to us that we should they should be guided by tag if we tell them that tag is okay and with platelet count is less than 50000 or inr is 2 still they will not put in a central line and we have to make extra efforts to convince them even though on paper it looks good but i don't know what happens in the icu settings you know non hepatologists still are not convinced about it, the utility maybe professor alam you'll like to comment on that totally totally agree sir thank you uh, this... what has happened to ncpf in uh, pakistan is it become is it still prevalent it's becoming very rare in india uh, it's rare in uh, pakistan and we, we have very yeah. few studies related to non serotic portal hypertension and it's mainly due to extra hepatic yeah. portal vein obstruction uh, yeah, not people answer. like you uh, it's I, I expect the same answer from you uh, but 30 years back when i started practice in pakistan we used to see a lot of patients but like dr anin alora is just mentioned that you know over a period of time the numbers are declining almost to negligible levels and we are seeing less and less thank you so i have a comment um so i agree yes. Um, the number has decreased even if I would uh, just uh, observe that at our center during last uh, 10 years what is the situation but we are still seeing these diseases coming and um, it's I would I would say that this is uh, not negligible this is uncommon but yes this is these cases that do exist and they are coming maybe roughly sometime one in hundred or one in two one in 150 something like that but yes it is still the cases are coming uh, we have another this is not extinct but it is drastically much less than what we used to see when we were doing our graduation uh, we have another question from Dr. Ajit for Professor Altaf Alam again. Any role of radiological interventions in established portal vein thrombosis? Okay. Uh, we hardly ever catch them in a hyper-acute phase. But if you do, uh, thrombolysis has been tried. Uh, the results are equivocal. And we think that uh, anticoagulation should be as good as uh, any other uh, measures like thrombolysis or even uh, radiological measures. But if you cannot anticoagulate a patient, maybe TIPS, which is also a radiological intervention, uh, may be justified to prevent the effects of uh, portal vein thrombosis. In fact, uh, I'll, I fully agree with Professor Alam. There is a recent publication. You see, you should understand that access to the portal vein is not easy where do you get it either it is a through the transhepatic route or through the transjugular route so if there is a good data recently to show a randomized trial of tissue thrombolysis within the portal vein versus the intravenous anticoagulation and both were found to be equally good so getting an access to the portal vein is not easy so i'll support whatever you say uh, may i ask thank, uh, thank you dr anil so, uh, may Zagin. I ask a question to Jordan? Uh, I can see he's sitting quiet. Thank you, Jordi, for joining us. And uh, Dr. Abbas is here. So, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, about uh, different ways that we can prevent vasoconstriction, uh, which is the reversible element in portal hypertension. So, uh, uh, what is uh, your opinion about modifying the gut flora? As you know that uh, from the gut we have PAM which is pathogen associated uh, molecular patterns that are released and uh, they also affect uh, like uh, they, they m release many cytokines and mediators and they act on toll like uh, receptors and uh, they may be the part uh, which is the reversible part in modulating uh, the portal hypertension so if you can modify the gut flora by somehow do you believe that this would be helpful in uh, the looking after the reversible component or maybe long term i am not sure what is the role of this uh, pamp in non serotic portal fibrosis dr anil is also here perhaps later on he may also throw on light that uh, 
modulating gut flora can in also modulate non cirrhotic part of fibrosis or not dr jordi thanks for for uh, for the question professor abbas and thanks for the invitation to to joining during your annual meeting i, I also enjoy the, the the presentations for my uh, for the from the other two colleagues so i think you're you're very right the 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 role of the microbiota is it's key in the development and, and the aggravation of portal hypertension. Indeed, it has been shown that different bacterial products coming from the gut may exacerbate the inflammatory pathways and the vasoconstrictor pathways of the cirrhotic liver. Both preclinical models and also clinical observations evidence the, the increase in bacterial products in patients and preclinical models of chronic liver disease. And this is associated with a, an, an increase in portal pressure. Also from preclinical models, we know, for example, that using different microbiota modulators like uh, lactobacillus, different, different uh, strains of, of lactobacillus, and also even statins in preclinical models of ACLF, acute and chronic liver failure due to sepsis. Uh, statins also improve the, the portal hypertension syndrome and the survival in, in preclinical models. Indeed, the use of statins antibiotics is, is now uh, being evaluated in a phase three clinical trial, which is, is called Liver Hope. And they are evaluating here in Barcelona as well, they are evaluating the role or the applicability of antibiotic plus simvastatin for the prevention of the complications of ACLF. So I agree, the role of microbiota is, it, it has been uh, studied. We, we need to further evaluate the role of microbiome in, in, in cirrhosis and in complications of chronic liver disease. But for sure, uh, also you have to have a, a, tomorrow a symposium with Jas Bajaj from, from the United States, and I'm sure he can also provide data about the, the biarity and the, and the richness of, of microbiota and the improvement in portal pressure and, and chronic liver disease if you have a, a, a variety of different microbiota in, in the cat. So totally, totally agree. About non-cirrhotic portal hypertension, maybe uh, uh, my colleague can can uh, can answer that that question. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Zagam, I think it's very uh, important question which you have raised. But I think the story of microbiota, we are always trying to put the cart ahead of the horse. We always talk of FMT in alcoholic hepatitis. We talk of giving FMD in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, fatty liver disease, obesity, when we do not even know, do we have abnormal microbiota in patients with alcoholic hepatitis versus placebo or patients with non-alcoholic, uh, non-alcohol related cirrhosis. I think we still need far more work on the basic sciences of microbiota before we jump on to the phase two, phase three trial of the therapeutics. Because we do not know what is the type of bacteria is it, the micro, is it the microbiome which is relevant in the large bowel versus the dis- small bowel? Is it the proximal versus the middle versus the distal small bowel? Nobody knows that. And, and even without looking at that basic biodata, if we're trying to do the phase two, phase three studies, I think we're just trying to jump the gun. I think we still need, everything is implicated to microbiota, be it peptic ulcer disease, say coronary artery disease, you talk of Alzheimer's disease, you just try to implicate it. Why not have the basic data? We have alcoholic cirrhosis, which are in abundance all over the world. Let's have 1,000 alcoholic cirrhosis and see their microbiota versus those who have non-alcoholic cirrhosis. If it is different, then only we should try to go. But coming back to the NCPF, one of the major reasons for problem of translocation of the microbiome from the gut lumen into the circulation is the leaky gut, which tends to occur with, with raised portal pressure, which is likely to occur both in patients with the cirrhosis and non-cirrhotic portal fibrosis, so they may be equally liable. And one of the advantages of using beta blockers in patients with cirrhosis is, other than reducing portal pressure, they prevent the leakiness of the gut. So that is a non-portal hypertensive effect of beta blocker. That is what uh, one of the speakers were trying to say. So I think we should have more bi- biodata on more basic research on the type of differences in categories of the diseases before we initiate the trials. Another question is about uh, lenifibranor. Um, you mentioned about some of the studies, and I know that this is a drug which is uh, being used uh, for uh, non, uh, this uh, non, uh, non-alcoholic state of hepatitis also, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
So, uh, because of its effects on PPAR receptors, uh, all the three types of PPAR receptors, so do you believe that uh, using uh, this drug, lenifibranor, uh, this is because of the prevention of uh, maybe steatosis or this is directly acting on some of the endothelial cells or uh, stellate cells or uh, GUFA cells, uh, how this drug is uh, acting? to prevent the portal hypertension or decreasing the portal hypertension. We know this is antifibrotic drug, but how come this is also affecting in the reversible portal hypertension? Thanks for the question. Um, indeed, um, I think one of the best um, characteristics of lanifibranor is its property to activate the three P parts. So there, there have been some reports using uh, individual people and agonists like, uh, like uh, hybrid, for example. But uh, with this one, we know that, for example, with PPAR alpha, we are improving steatosis in hepatocytes. So we are improving uh, fatty, acid, uh, fatty acid oxidation uh, and lipogenesis in, in the hepatocytes. We know that with delta, we are mostly improving uh, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, improving the phenotype of these cells, and with gamma we are improving hepatic stellate cells. So it's not mathematics, eh? it's not just alpha for one cell type, bet, uh, delta for another cell type, etc. But I think for the treatment of very complex diseases like NASH or, or chronic liver disease, we need some kind of pleiotropic drugs, drugs that target more than one specific uh, molecular and cellular pathway because we have some, some evidence from clinical trials using very specific drugs targeting one single uh, mechanism that, that gave a, a, a negative results. So we, we all know the, the, the different drugs, for example, from, from Gilead Sciences that in phase two, phase two uh, show no, no benefits on, on fibrosis or NASH in, in patients with, with these chronic and very complex diseases. So I think the story with and PPAR agonist or with statins or with oveticolic acid. I think the benefits from, from these uh, drugs, they come because these drugs are very pleiotropic. They touch different pathways in different cell types, which at the end improves the phenotype globally in the liver and probably are much better than single specific drugs targeting one, uh, one single uh, molecular pathway. Thank you. So, uh, another question from Professor Anil Arora. Uh, what is the role of liver biopsy for the diagnosis of non serotic portal hypertension? Uh, it's a question from Dr. Mohammad Asif. Is it mandatory? Yeah, uh, this is an important question. The only reason today, in the era of availability of FibroScan, good quality CT angiography, and key clinical course, is to rule out cirrhosis of the liver not to document NCPA. You know, if I'm sure Dr. Altaf will remember, there used to be an entity called portal venogram, which will show a classical fern-like pattern, which is a peripheral pruning of the portal venous radicals in patients with non serotic portal fibrosis, which is obsolete now. You have a good quality CT and geo. So far as you are able to show a normal portal vein to rule out EHPVO, a fibro scan which is normal, so there is hardly any justification of even doing a liver biopsy. So in case you are bent upon ruling out a etiological cause, a biopsy should be done to rule out cirrhosis, not to diagnose NCPA, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, there is another question So from... if you have a combination of HPPG and FibroScan, you don't need a liver biopsy today. Uh, Professor Anil, there is another question from uh, you, it's regarding uh, NCPF. So what is the difference between NCPF or idiopathic non serotic portal hypertension? Is it same or some different entities? Yeah, see, MC, non serotic portal fibrosis is a total very wide etiological spectrum. As I said, it, you, see, NCPF will also be including cystosomiasis. It will be including non serotic portal fibrosis, idiopathic portal hypertension, incomplete okay. septal fibrosis, etc. Whereas idiopathic portal hypertension was an entity which was propounded by people from Japan, which almost described the same entity, except once you have a different etiological agent, be it phlebothrombosis in poor country like ours, or a prothrombotic states in countries like Japan, which have a far better 
economic standard than ours. So that etiology may vary in terms of infection versus prothrombotic state. Pathology is almost the same. So idiopathic, uh, idiopathic portal fibrosis is one component of a broader disease spectrum called NCPF. Thank you, Professor Ani. If you have Ani. cystosomia, you will have pre-sinusoidal portal hypertension, you will call it NCPF. You will not call it idiopathic because you have a reason for that. So, so far, very informative uh, symposium on portal hypertension. So we are running short of time. So I would request the chairs of the session, Professor Masood Sadiq, Professor Hasnan Ali Shah, Professor Ghasun Nabi Tayyab, Professor Farooq Saeed. So sir, please conclude this session. So this quiz is for residents only. So number one question is- We cannot is, participate. <laughs> So question number one, for most common presenting symptom of non serotic portal hypertension, is it ascites, chronic liver failure, encephalopathy, upper gastrointestinal bleeding? See, so we want uh, uh, other than Jalpa Devi this time. <laughs> Mohammed Asif, if you are resident, then you will win the prize. Otherwise, Hafiz Haris will win the prize. So please send your contact numbers so we can confirm. I, th I think ha Mohammed Asif, Asif is, is consultant? consultant, yes. Okay. Hafiz okay. Haris. So Hafiz uh, is a Haris, you have won the prize. Congratulations. Answer is also. upper gastrointestinal bleeding. So uh, the next question. Is what is the mechanism of action of octreotide? Number A is planktonic vasoconstriction. Number B is planktonic vasodilation. Number C increased secretion of growth hormone. Number D mesenteric vasodilation. E sodium potassium 2 chloride inhibitors. <laughs> so, who is the winner? Mohammed Ehsan Farooq. So tell them the correct answer. <coughs> so the correct answer is splenchonic vasoconstriction. The correct so answer is splenchonic vasoconstriction option A. Okay. 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 So Mohammed Hassan Farooq, please share your contact number, and you will be <coughs> sent the prize money. Yes. Okay. Congratulations. Okay, thank you uh, for all the esteemed guests, participants for, uh, for this um, the session. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very you much, everybody. everyone.